Yeah, it is lovely to be here and happy birthday, church. As well. Oh, yours tomorrow? Anyone else got a birthday this week? Let's. <gasps> Isla! Eight. Give it a big ten. Nine. Oh my goodness. How has that happened? Nine. So we have two special mm. birthdays. My dad's birthday yesterday. And church, 56 years. I feel really, I feel like I can remember the 50th. Where have those six years gone? It's just, time is just flying, isn't it? But we're flying under his wings, so that's the important bit. So in the year, Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it, it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has taken your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will me? go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. But the Lord said, whom shall I send? And I said, send me. We will start our worship with hymn number 503, Love Divine, or Love's Excelling.
um, a little story, because as you may remember, I do love stories. But a few weeks ago, I led um, a women's conference, a women's retreat day. And the lady who led it, she was teaching us about spiritual disciplines. And she said that we have to practice the, the discipline of gratitude and thanksgiving. And she said, one little thing you should do is to pick a colour. And whenever you see that colour, you are reminded of God's love and his faithfulness. And you just get to reflect on everything that you, that you love. So I chose a colour. So she said when she'd started doing it, she had deliberately chosen a really difficult colour. <laughs> Aren't we wonderful as humans? And she said that um, she wanted to pick a colour that would be quite difficult to see. She was like, I'm not going to pick green and I'm not going to pick brown because they're, they're like all around. So she picked um, a very specific shade of purple. And as she was um, then going about her day, she suddenly realised that this particular purple was popping up everywhere. And she just couldn't believe it. And she was like, I feel like I tried to trick him, but God was just ahead of me. And there was so much of this purple in creation, even in the middle of November, she said. And it just kept coming up. So I sat there in this church and I thought, I know the colour I'm going to pick. And that's going to be quite a tricky one as well. And I sat through this whole conference. And then as I looked up at the end, I realised that the glass behind the cross at the very front was this particular shade of blue. And I have to say that the shade of blue I picked is the one I'm wearing because I just love the richness of this. And I felt like I wanted that reminder with me this morning as I came to join you. But as I walked in, I was suddenly reminded of how much of this blue is in this room right now. It's in your glass as I walked in. It's in your, like my chairs. And I just feel like, like I'm just surrounded by God's love in this place. Um, so do that yourself. Maybe challenge yourself this week. Challenge yourself, not him. He already knows what colour you're going to pick. Um, but maybe have a colour so that when you see it, whatever you are, wherever you are, whatever the circumstances, you are reminded of God's love for you and that he's with you and that he's gone ahead of you. So yeah, that's your colour challenge for this week. Pick and I can see a beautiful lady sat there in the same blue. So there we go. He's so good. Let us pray. O oh, mighty King, your crystal heavens shine upon us the light of your glory. Every night you enfold us with the comfort of your love, and each new morning you surround us with the freshness of your grace. Without words, you speak of your love for the world. In timeless silences of beauty and hope, you are Alpha and Omega sunrise and sunset you birth and rebirth of the world you meet us in the morning as the dew on the grass you nourish us as the corn of the field you treasure us as the apple of your eye though we run from your presence and are afraid to be loved yet in your time your light shines in every corner and your peace stills every storm. Your breath is the life of all living. Your words are perfect, fulfilling, complete. A staff to the frail, a guide to the lost, wisdom to the world. We offer hearts and lives in praise and prayer, for we know you to be our God. Hear us, see us, touch us, O oh friend and king. Receive our gifts of praise and need and meet us in this hour. So God of deliverance, that we have been ungrateful for the freedom you have given us, failing to put you first in our lives and preferring to make our own gods from material things. 
Forgive us, merciful God, that we may be renewed in holiness and grace. O oh God of truth, we have tried to deceive you, each other and ourselves, resisting your discipline of grace, reluctant to devote ourselves to your created glory. Forgive us, merciful God, that we may be renewed in holiness and grace. O oh God of love, we have not lived in reverence, compassion and mercy with our families, our neighbours or your world. We have lost our awe of you, of creation, of life itself. So forgive us, merciful God, that we may be renewed in holiness and grace. Speak to our trembling hearts, holy God, that we may be renewed through hearing your word and live out your purposes in wisdom, carefulness and joy. So merciful God, we confess that we have not remained true to your purpose for us. We have spoiled your pleasant planting with our arrogance and obstinacy. We have not yielded the fruit of your asking, but have followed our own path of rebellion and deceit. We have allowed the briars of hatred and the thorns of violence to grow unhindered in our midst. So forgive us, God of mercy. Hear and heal us. Restore and renew us that we may once again grow true to your intention and live to your praise and glory. Amen. And we join together as one family in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We're now going to sing Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. Think Psalm 84. The reading is taken from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Barker. They make it a place of, string, of springs. The autumn rain also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favour on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a son and shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. 
O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Amen. And now I hand over to the choir. Thank you. I'm just going to repeat the, the words in that final verse. Yeah. So no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man will ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I stand. Amen indeed. And I think that ties in so beautifully because now we're going to hear Revelation 22.
The reading is taken from Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 to 21. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll because the time is near. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right and let the holy person continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. I love to include that passage um, in sermons because I think it's so important. I never like to go straight to the end of a book. I love that anticipation of turning the next page. But this is a book that I think is worth reading the end first because then it reassures us. So no matter what else the circumstances, he is coming. He is coming back. Fact. You either believe it or you don't. Personally, I say, yes, he's coming. And as I look around at the world, I can't help but think things are speeding up and we're on track. He is coming back. So as we prepare to hear the message that he um, has delivered to me to pass on to you, we are going to sing, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord.
This time yesterday, I had a whole different sermon prepared for you. And then I woke up this morning with the words roots, just blasting out roots. So I sat for a while and I thought, ah, what do you mean roots? You're going to have to give me more than that. But then he reminded me that today as our church anniversary, it is about celebrating our roots. And it can be very easy, can't it, at this time that we spend time looking back and we come up with all the beautiful memories that you have shared together in this place and previous to this place. Because this is an anniversary of a building, but you are so much more than a building and have been a presence and God's presence in this community. Um, for so much more than that. So I was thinking, right, roots, we're gonna celebrate roots and we're gonna look at that. And then I was just reminded, but what are our roots? What are our roots? And we can look up, I mean, I'll be honest, this might tell you something. I didn't notice that when I walked in. <laughs> didn't notice it at all. Um, but I, I recognize it, but let's be honest, only probably people within Methodism would recognise that that is the Methodist way of life. Always used to make me laugh when I worked for the church. I'm like, what does that even mean, the Methodist way of life? But, but we are Methodists, we are rooted in Methodism. And then we think, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be rooted in Methodism? Uh, I do a lot of work in, in Wensbury Methodism now. So you can imagine they are very proud of their Methodist roots there, where John Wesley uh, preached. There is a big stone in West Central Methodist Church in Wensbury that he apparently stood on to preach. If you go to Wensbury and go to the Morrisons, I mean, seriously, this, this is exciting. There is uh, a big, like, ironwork like, sculpture of John Wesley preaching on the side of Morrison's in Wensbury. And I love it every time I drive past and I just see him with his Bible preaching the word over Wensbury. And so we, we've got those roots. But actually, if John Wesley walked in here now, would he even recognise us as, as people who, who followed him? I'm not so sure he would, but there we go. But then we have to go further back than that, can't we? I was at um, a talk with, um, with work. I work for an organisation now called Safe Families. We're a Christian charity. And uh, one of our national team came and gave us a two-hour presentation the other day on history of the denominations. Oh, I tell you, it was more exciting than I thought it was going to be. Um, but oh my goodness, it raised some tensions amongst the groups because people were getting so fierce about their denominations and whether they were right and they were wrong. And I just went, can we go further back than our denominations? And I'm going to take us right back to what I truly think is our roots. The word of God. And the beautiful son of God that came to give us life and life in abundance and that is Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, our Saviour. He is our roots. So today we're going to have a little look. So as I was praying this morning in a bit of like with a blank page in front of me, he reminded me that I am the, I am the rock, I am the foundations, I'm what you are building everything else upon. Everything else is very pretty, but as we heard in Revelation, one day it's all going to be gone and what we're going to be left with is Jesus returning. What a day that will be. Now, I don't know if you remember, I'm sure quite a few of you in here, I'm quite confident that some of you years ago wore the bangles, wore the bracelets that said, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And it was, we wore them, didn't we? I used to have it on the screensaver of my, my first Nokia all those years ago. That, and it was to be that constant reminder of, you know, if we're ever, you know, if we're not sure what to do, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? But I've always thought that that 
possibly isn't the question we should have ever been asking because quite often I think when I hear the people and I go out into the world that sometimes maybe we have twisted the answer to that question to suit ourselves and to make God fit into a world context. Now, I don't know about you, but it makes me incredibly uncomfortable when I see Christians trying to make God fit into the world. I think we're on very dangerous ground when we do that, because as we are told throughout scripture, that we are in the world, but not of it. And if we try to blend too much into the world, how will people know? where we are when they need us because let's never forget that the world is is controlled by the devil satan is in charge of this world and he is the one that is trying to capture people in so we are called to be light aren't we light and salt we are to stand out from the crowd and the only way we can do that is to show jesus so i personally think Better initials for us to have worn on our wrist is WDJD because that is what did Jesus do? And we know what he did because of the accounts in the Word of God. And if you think back to, let's go back to the Garden of Eden, what was the very first thing? that led us into the path of sin. What allowed sin in? It was when the enemy just asked one very simple question to Adam and to Eve. Is that really what God said? Is that really what he said? And by putting in that tiny seed of doubt into God's word, sin entered the world. And we are still paying the price today. So, is it really what God says? As I often preach, we either believe the Bible or we don't. We don't get to pick and choose which bits we follow. We don't get, we've just heard in our scriptures, do not add or take away. Because for everything we add, he will add a curse to us. And stay away from the curses if I can. Don't always manage it. So how do we know what he did? Well, we can read the Bible. We can find out what Jesus did. Who was he as a person? What did he do? Well, we know that he followed the law. We know that he studied the law and he followed it. He kept Sabbath. He kept the feast days that are listed in the Bible. He would have just finished um, celebrating tabernacles, feast of tabernacles. He would have done that. He kept the dietary laws. Because that's what, he, that's what he says. Now, so many people will say to me when I talk about this, these are, these are facts, this is, this is what we, if we believe it, we believe it. And people will say, yeah, but he did that because he was a Jew. Well, he was a member of the house of the tribe of Judah. But actually, all of the tribes followed it. It wasn't just for the house of Judah. It was for all of God's people. So actually, if we are to become more Christ-like, maybe we just simply need to do what Christ did and not add things or make things up or pick up other customs along the way and then just try and make it okay. Because that isn't what Jesus did. Because then people will say to me, and I'm going into the book of Matthew now. So then people will say, but the Elizabeth, we don't have to follow all that. It's done away with. The law is done away with. But actually, and I love this Bible. This was the Bible I received here when I became an accredited preacher. And I absolutely love it. And I especially love it because it makes it even clearer to me what Jesus said. Because it's in red. So it, it makes it simpler. And in Matthew 5, starting at 17, it says, Jesus himself said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. 
Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless you righteousness, your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. With that, it's quite clear, isn't it? That is what he's saying. Now, as someone who studied language and loves reading, I then had to try and find out, right, let's dig into this. What do these words mean? Now, the word to fulfill actually means to do something that is expected, hoped for, or promised, or to cause it to happen. So Jesus is saying that he didn't come to do away with the law, to destroy it. He came to make sure that it happened and that we are following it. And then there's that line that one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't really know what a jot or a tittle was. So again, I had to look it up and a tittle is a dot. It's a punctuation. So he's saying... Never mind changing my words or taking a word out of this. Don't even take away a full stop. Just don't change anything. My word is my word. And if we don't preach it, we don't teach it, and we don't live it, you're not getting into the kingdom of God. You're not. Scary times. But Jesus did come, didn't he? He did come to show us the way, and that should be our roots. Because Jesus also said, so in John 13, 34 to 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That you love one another. By all this, people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, again, I've heard people say to me, oh, well, that's it. We don't have to do everything else. We don't have to do the Old Testament stuff because Jesus came to give us a new commandment. But at no point did he say, I'm doing away with them. He said, I'm giving you a new one. It's an extra one. This is how people will know me because they will see my love in you. We see his love through through us so I've got a few questions to ask you now don't worry you're not gonna have to put your hand up this is not confession time this is this is between you and God but do we show that love and sometimes it's easy to go well yeah of course I do I'm really kind I'm really nice what to everyone to your enemies do we love our enemies Maybe an easier way of looking at it is the question is, when you walk into a space, does the atmosphere change? And by that I mean for the good, not, uh-oh, he's here. We don't want that. But do you bring the Holy Spirit with you? Do you people spend time with you and just think, there's something different there, there's something different. What is it about you? Why are you so hopeful? Why, what do you have? Why are you so joyful? Do people catch that in you? Because the truth is, every minute of the day, we are on duty for God. Now, I don't mean we are busy for God. Again, I think the enemy celebrates exhaustion far too much. And he loves this idea that well, I'm just so busy doing things that I don't have time for anything else. I just don't have time to sit and pray. I just don't have time because I'm so busy. Our diaries can be jam-packed with stuff to the point that at the end of the day, we're just like, I am done. I'm done. Don't ask me anything else. Someone comes up with the idea of a new rotor and we all just avoid eye contact. No more rotors. <laughs> yeah, let's just leave it at that, shall we? But the fact is, 
we are on every minute for God. And sometimes that, you know, all you have to do to be on duty for God is to be you, who he created you to be. Just that. And it sounds so simple, doesn't it? Because it is. So again, at the retreat that I was, that I was at the other day, the lady leading it, she, she talked about, she took us back to, um, well, she took me back in my mind to the Last Supper. And the talk, you know, this idea, and it's, it's been coming up a lot for me recently, that when Jesus was at the Last Supper, on the one side he had Judas, and on the other side he had John, the one that he loved. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always a little struggled with this, with this title that I always felt John gave himself. John, the one that Jesus loved. And I used to think, gosh, that's a bit arrogant, isn't it? You know, that's a bit of a bold statement to make. What was so special about him? But as I was reminded the other day, that actually that title is the one that applies to each and every one of us the one from the moment you accepted Jesus into your life that became your name and just think for a moment of how that changes everything how if we just went about our lives every day with that certainty with that absolute truth that, hi, I'm Elizabeth, the one that Jesus loves. Hi, I'm Isla, the one that Jesus loves. I'm Joseph, the one that Jesus loves. It changes everything. And the beautiful thing is, you have done nothing to deserve it. You've done nothing to earn it. And you can do nothing to lose it. You are the one that Jesus loves. If we step into our full potential of who he has called us to be, then we are going to do amazing things. But, oh, does there have to be a but? Yes, there does. Because we don't always believe that truth of ourselves. And we don't always walk and act like we carry that love or that we know it. But we have to know it. So please sit with it. If it's making you a little uncomfortable to hear that truth about yourself, then good, because that's the Holy Spirit saying, come on, push deeper, push deeper. Get to know me deeper. So then when we sit with him, when we rest in it, then we allow him to transform us. And it's when we are in that safe place of love that we can then be our true selves with him and we can just come to him and just be like, right, we need to talk because there's things in my life that I need rooting out. And that was the next part of the rooting that he gave me. Because if we are to focus on our roots and we are to root ourselves in him and root ourselves on the rock that is Jesus, then there are definitely things we need to root out of our lives. Now again, I'm not asking you to come and tell me what things need rooting out. That again is between you and God. But it is my prayer that when we know that we are loved beyond measure, that we can then go to our Heavenly Father and ha start having those difficult conversations. I always say to my son, there is nothing you can't tell me. There is nothing he can't tell me. Now, he knows as well that there are things he's going to tell me that they might not make me very happy. They might make me quite sad. I might get quite annoyed with what I hear, but I still want to hear it because I love him. 
I love him. And he needs to know that he can tell me anything because I am his safe place. More importantly, he always needs to know that his heavenly father is his ultimate safe place. But that is what I feel God is saying to you today, to his beloved children here at Trinity, that you are the ones he loves. He wants you to know it. He wants you to sit with it. And then he wants you to go to him and ask him to show you what does need to be rooted out. Where are we being disobedient? Where are we heading slightly off on a little tangent that is going to lead us so far away from him that it's going to take a lot of effort to get back? There is always a way back. But where have we strayed away from the word of God? Where have we fallen into that trap of, well, I think this is what the word means because we just love each other. But we're called to love as God loves not as the world loves. And there is a very big difference. Our disobedience limits us. It limits us and clips our wings. And we can't fly then. And that is what God is calling us to. So Trinity, know today that you are the ones that Jesus loves. That's it. That's all you need to know about yourselves. Sit with it, let it rest in you, and then rise and walk every day with that confidence. And then climb into Father's lap and say, Papa, I've got something to tell you. He already knows. It's not going to take him by surprise. But let him root out anything in you that is stopping you reaching your potential that is stopping you flying because you are the one that Jesus loves and he came to give you life and life in abundance. So live it. Amen. We're now going to come to our prayers of intercession. No, we're not. We are going to sing, O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder. And then we're going to do our prayers of intercession with a special focus on praying for Israel.
So during our prayers of intercession, in the quiet, we bring before God those on our hearts today, those who are feeling the pain of loss and bereavement. We pray for God to comfort them, for those who are awaiting surgery or doctor's appointments, we pray that God's peace will surpass all understanding and guide them through the coming days and weeks. For those in our community who are feeling the pains of isolation and loneliness, may God's comfort make them know that they are loved and belong. So let us pray. Lord, we bring to you our concern about the world, our concern for the oppressed, the powerless and exploited, our concern about injustice and about war. And we offer you our votes, our voices, our pens, our power, our prayers. This morning we particularly are praying for the people of Israel. We pray for the families who have known loss. Loss of life, loss of homes, loss of provision. We pray for those who've been taken hostage and we pray for those who are injured. Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together where the tribes go to the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. So we pray for the peace of Israel. Lord, we bring to you our concern about the world, our concern for the needy, the hungry and the homeless our concern about disease and want, and we offer you our money and our time, our standard of living, our prayers. We pray today, especially for the, for the homeless community within the city of Wolverhampton. And we pray for increased resources for those that seek to offer provision. Lord, we bring to you our concern about society, our concern for the disadvantaged and those discriminated against, our concern for the young, our concern for the elderly. And we offer you our help and our family life, our friendship and our work. We offer you our prayers. Lord, we bring to you our concern about the people whom we know and love. Concern for those ill in body or mind. Concern for the bereaved or sorrowful. Concern for the anxious or depressed. And we offer you our listening and our doing, our words and our touch and we offer you our prayers. Okay. 
Lord, in Jesus Christ, we see your concern for the world and for each one of us. And we learn the truth that your name is love. We offer you our adoration and thanks, our love and our lives. We offer you our prayers that you will use us and perfect us. We offer you our prayers and our lives in the name of Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. Amen. And we will finish our praise and worship today with the wonderful hymn, it's not hymn, it's a song, These Are the Days of Elijah. Not as its conquerors, but as servants of all whom you find there. Go into the vineyard to discover God who is the gardener, renewing Eden throughout the earth. Go and share the good news. Jesus is coming back. Amen. Amen. Let's not forget the collection, Steve. So, Father, we ask that you would bless these offerings, that they may be used to renew and build your kingdom here in this community. Amen. <laughs> 